Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governor and candidate for Senate John Fetterman, who is thankfully recovering from his stroke, has pitched himself as a, quote, blue top collar tough guy to voters, but now Republicans in the state, including Fetterman's challenger Dr. Oz, <laughs> Dr. Oz, have accused Fetterman of being a, quote, sheep in wolf's clothing and a fake populist. Dr. Oz is calling John Fetterman a fake populist. It's amazing. It's ripped. According to the Inquirer, a public record show, and Fetterman has openly acknowledged that for a long stretch, lasting well into his 40s, his main source of income came from his parents, who gave him and his family $54,000 in 2015 alone. Fetterman grew up, in his own words, in a cush cushy environment in York County. His upbringing helped him get an MBA from the University of Connecticut, a master's degree from Harvard, without taking on student debt. Fetterman now earns over $200,000 a year as lieutenant governor, and his family's assets top $700,000. All right, Katie, uh, this is actually, I know I just mocked Dr. Oz, but I do think John Fetterman deserves some mockery here, too, because... Uh, Credit, like, he's actually very honest, yes. right? Like, we just quoted him in his own words. Right. He came from a, quote, cushy upbringing. I have had an experience, though, where I tell people sometimes to talk about the Pennsylvania race, like, you know, John Fetterman is actually, like, pretty wealthy. Guy went sure. to Harvard. It's sort of shocking to people because he's so successful at curating a different image. Right. Well, I mean, I think that it's, it's kind of rich because, you know, so basically Republicans are accusing Fetterman of being a fake everyman <laughs> while he's running against a fake <laughs> Pennsylvanian. <laughs> so I think he's still better off than, than Oz, uh, who doesn't even live there. But I do think that this is a pretty, honestly, in my opinion, irresponsible headline because, uh, first of all, of course, Republicans say that that undercuts his blue collar image, that mm -hmm. he, has, he got money from his parents. But as you pointed out, he was very open about this. He said that, and I admire someone who had opportunities, and because of that, and realized that other people don't have those opportunities, that has motivated him in a certain way to be almost like a class trader. So I think that that's admirable, as opposed to someone who comes from a cushy background and only cares about other people who have come from cushy backgrounds. I mean, what he did with his career was he was made very little money as a, as a mayor. He worked, uh, he dedicated his life to public service. And so for me, it's, again, it's much more impressive and admirable to come from money and then advocate for people who don't have money than it is to come from money and only care about other people who have lots of money. Although it's much easier to do when you have something to fall back on. Uh, right, certainly. but I think he would be the first person to admit that. And right? yeah, we, we yes. just quoted him. Admitting yeah, it. yeah, right, yeah. So, and it actually relates back to the, the anti-work uh, segment we were doing earlier, mm -hmm. which is how if you, if you have an income, I mean, this is a little unrelated, but if you have an income unrelated to having a job, a baseline, you, a baseline income, yeah. then you can pursue things that are both uh, you consider to be worthy. But in this case, you can pursue, pursue things that are good for people. One of my, and, and as things have like shifted, I've, I've definitely like changed on how I see a lot of government policies and all these things. But I will say one thing that always does bother me on the left, and that's why I think this story is relevant, is that it's very different to advocate for Medicare for all or advocate against fracking when you haven't lived paycheck to paycheck. Um, and I think for a lot of people in Pennsylvania, you know, your, your style is a, sort of something that you're communicating to voters. That's important. Sure. We know how seriously politicians take it. That's why Mitt Romney rolls up his sleeves um, and you know, tries to convince everybody he gets it. But I think that is, you know, I think voters do have, certainly have a right to know it. I do think it's relevant when you're purporting to take the mantle of the working class right. to communicate like what might genuinely be confusing to people based on all the Carhartt garb that like, sure. except Carhartt yeah. is, has been appropriated by rich people too. Right. Uh, but it's totally, I think it's totally relevant because work, the, the actual, the actual conversation among people in the working class isn't exactly, does not exactly the way, mirror the way the left likes to think it does. Yeah, but I mean, obviously, when you're talking about people living from paycheck to paycheck, like the people who benefit most from Medicare for all are those people. So for me, he's not a fake populist because his policies are indeed populist. And, you know, you can go back to FDR, who was probably the most populist of all in terms of um, policy. And he was extremely patrician, you know, like nothing, like leagues, extremely privileged, much more than Fetterman is. Um, you know, he was basically an aristocrat. So I think that, uh, you know, the policy is really what determines whether or not you're a fake po populist, not your personal experience. And again, what he did with his parents' uh, support, 
was he was actually going to take over his parent, his dad's insurance company. And he instead, what he did was he like uh, uh, mentored uh, mm -hmm. orphan ch children, uh, led a program to help high school dropouts, became mayor of uh, Braddock. And again, he did always disclose it. And he disclosed his parents' support, actually, um, and even when he wasn't required to. So I think that the reason I think this is an irresponsible headline is because it basically takes a Republican talking point and makes it look like a news, breaking news story. So one of the, the media does it all the time for Democrats, of course, but yes, yeah, I see what you're saying. Sure. Um, the, something interesting would be like, if you look at uh, minimum wage policies or fracking policies, minimum wage, depending on where it's being implemented and how it's being implemented, absolutely, probably most of the time benefits workers immediately. But it also, in different cases, will not have an effect on the donors to the Democratic Party that own those small or big businesses because they passed the cost on mm. uh, by firing people and they're still fine. Or like fracking is a good example. A lot of people will be uh, laid off, lose jobs, and the companies that donate, green energy companies that donate to Democratic politicians, they end up having more sway, they get a boost. And so it's just always, it's not always as clear cut, I think. And not that people don't say these things with the best of intentions, but it does really bother me when wealthy Democrats talk a populist game. And that's sort of why, that's my argument for why the story is relevant. Yeah. Sure, but again, I would just go back to the FDR example, right? Which is that you can totally. you can um, oh yeah govern absolutely as a populist without having lived that the the you know experience of most Americans. Hundred yeah. percent, the unemployment rate hit a historic low uh, under the presidency of the probably fakest populist <laughs> ever, which would be Donald Trump. Right. Uh, I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah. you know, a fake populist is probably not a great label for him because there were a lot of different things he did that genuinely were populist. Uh, but in terms of like understanding sure, the plight the of, of right, the working yeah. man, yeah, yeah, man or woman, that's a different question, right? <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. Well, that was a that was a good conversation. Yeah, Katie. yeah. All Fetterman, right. come on the show. Oh, you absolutely. Should, right. That'd be great. A hundred percent. Super, super interesting candidate. That is one of the most interesting races in the country yeah, agree, yeah. because it's exactly pitting um, somebody who wants to like carry the mega populist right. mantle, like Dr. Oz, against somebody who has, I think, probably a more legitimate claim to representing the interests of working people. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, uh, Dr. Oz is such a flip flop. I mean, if you look at him, <sighs> oh he, everything changed very recently. And he's uh, trying to run on a culture war too. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's a, it's yeah. a fascinating Even though race. he was very different on trans issues before. It's, oh. so, op it's so opportunistic, but it's actually 100%. similar to Trump's evolution on those issues too. Totally. Uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Arizona, big races to watch and we will be following those here on Rising Fridays for sure. And on that note, we will have more Rising Fridays right after this. <laughs>